We had looked at uh, Revelation chapter 2. We had looked at the church at Ephesus. And today we're going to be looking at the church at Smyrna. So I'm going to read the text here. Uh, this is the shortest letter of any of the letters written to the seven churches. And uh, it's only four verses long. And we'll read that. And then um, we'll, I'll tell you a little story about somebody from this church. Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. All right, so um, this church at Smyrna is only about uh, 35 miles from the church at Ephesus. And uh, in, this, um, in this church, at Smyrna, there was um, an individual whose name you may recognize, uh, Polycarp. So Polycarp, um, as you may or may not be aware, was, um, was a man who was actually taught by the Apostle John. So St. John, um, as his student, he taught Polycarp. And um, that's pretty, pretty notable how, how close this was to that time. Polycarp uh, never met the Lord, but of course his instructor had been a disciple of the Lord. So the, the name Polycarp is a little unusual, um, unlike some other names in the Bible, like I think the name James might be four or five different Jameses in the, in the Bible. Uh, Polycarp is a very unusual name, uh, probably you don't know any, I would guess. and. Um, it's speculated that this was not his given name from his parents. There were times and places in history where uh, somebody would be given a name or maybe choose a name at their baptism. And this even happened into modern times, even like, uh, well, it happened in monasteries uh, throughout uh, history, but also even like at the Effort of Cloister, if some of you are familiar with that, in Effort of Pennsylvania there, uh, when somebody joined the cloister or was baptized there, they would choose um, a name. Now the name Polycarp uh, it's a, sounds like a compound word. Uh, what, what do you hear when you hear the word Polycarp? Poly, Poly means many, okay. Now the last part, uh, carp, is not talking about fish. Uh, carp is actually the, the Greek word for fruit. So it means um, many or, or much, much fruit. And in fact, in John 15, uh, Jesus is talking about the vine and the branches. And Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears polycarp. That's actually the, what Jesus would have said. Bears much fruit. For, in me, uh, for without me, you can do nothing. So it's speculated. I don't think there's any um, proof of this, that um, probably either John or Polycarp himself may have uh, chosen this name at the time that he, at some time, maybe when he joined the church, maybe you, I don't know. And um, so that, that's just an interesting thing. It's a, a good name. So if uh, somebody wants to choose a new name for themselves, that's a suggestion there for you. Or if maybe uh, one of your moms wants to just keep that in mind, you know, for a baby name, be a good name. All right, so uh, Polycarp is most famous for his um, martyrdom. And I'm going to give you that account. We know a lot more about Polycarp besides just uh, his martyrdom. He had actually written some letters. He wrote a letter to the Philippians. He wrote a letter to several other churches as well, some of which uh, we don't have anymore. But um, in the early church writings, they'll say about Polycarp's writing to such a church, and we don't have that writing. But um, then other uh, letters were received uh, to him as well. So we have um, a, a lot of information about, about uh, him, at least in his um, time as 
a church leader. We don't know so much about his um, early life. But he became a, a well-known elder in the, in the early church. And uh, because of that, the persecution oftentimes targeted the, the elders. Everybody, you know, that was uh, in the church, you know, probably was disfavored. But the ones that they would go after for, uh, for capture and arrest and so on, oftentimes was first the, the elders, even like Stephen, you know, like there was a lot of people, there was thousands of Christians at that time of Stephen, but they, you know, put, put him to death because he was a, a leader. So Polycarp being an elder, he was an old man. He was um, 86 years old when he was being pursued. And um, shortly before his arrest, about three days before, he had a dream. And in his dream, he saw himself in bed sleeping or something, and his pillow uh, was on fire. And uh, then he woke up, and he told the people that he was with that um, he believes from this dream that he's going to be... Um, burned in, yeah, in, in martyrdom. So even, even so, he decides that he's going to stay near his home in Smyrna. And uh, some church brothers were like urging him, like, you need to, you know, save yourself, go somewhere, you know, don't just allow yourself to get caught here. So he, um, he took their advice. He went out into the countryside. And um, anyway, the people were trying to find him. And they went to his home in Smyrna. He wasn't there. They went to another place, and he had moved by then, and he moved a few times. And um, finally, he made a move, and he says, you know what, I'm just going to stay here, and if they find me, you know, um, that's okay. So um, he was staying with some friends out, outside of the city, and um, he was spending both uh, day and, and night in prayer. He was there for, for three days, and um, in the evening... It was around uh, mealtime, or close to mealtime. These um, police, they came to the house. They had been tipped off, which is another story, how they learned about where he was, but they had been tipped off on where he was. And so they came against him armed. And um, anyway, he was in a different room in the house, and the police came in the house, and he had this uh, opportunity where he could have uh, exited through a window and run away while they're in the house, and they would have lost him again. But instead, he says, you know what? Um, God's will be done. And so he, he stayed there. And uh, he went out to these people who were there for him. And he spoke with them. And they're like, you're... Like, they didn't realize that they're coming for this old, old man. And um, so anyway, they're like, like, why did we come to this uh, trouble of, you know, somebody this, uh, this aged? Anyway, so th he was staying with friends. And he tells his friends... Uh, you know, let's let's get a meal. Let's uh, prepare uh, food for these people, and so they did. And uh, so these captors of his um, had a meal there at the house after they had come to capture him. Then after the meal, then he tells them, "I'll go with you, but if you would just let me pray uh, for for an hour first. And so they they granted that, and he actually prayed in their presence for two hours. And uh, after that was done, they, um, they arrested him, and they took him back into Smyrna. And um, in Smyrna, there was a, a Colosseum. So um, there was a lot of people there in the Colosseum, a lot of Romans, but also a lot of Jews. And uh, the Jews being, um, you know, rejectors of, of the way, they had, um, they, they were also, like, um, enjoying the, the persecution of the Christians. So the Colosseum was like packed with a lot of Jews as well to, um, to see a Christian be, be killed. So as he's entering, as Polycarp is entering the Colosseum, there's this voice that's heard, and the voice says, be strong, Polycarp, and play the man. And many people heard the voice, came from heaven, and many people believed that it was the voice of, of God. So he's uh, standing there before the Roman official, and the official says, if you swear by Caesar, I will set you at liberty. And uh, all the crowd is listening to this, and they're all shouting and carrying on, and Polycarp responds, he says, for 86 years I have served him, and he never did me any harm. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? So anyway, they continued to uh, call on him to, to renounce Christ, and um, he says to them, 
since you are vainly urging that I should swear by the fortune of Caesar and pretend not to know who I am, hear me. I am a Christian. And the Roman official said that I have wild beasts in the Colosseum. I will cast you with them, except you change. And uh, Polycarp did not respond to that. And the Roman official says, I will cause you to be consumed by fire, seeing that you disregard the wild beasts and will not change. Polycarp said, you threaten me with fire, which burns for an hour, and after a little while is extinguished, but you are ignorant of the fire of the coming judgment and eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. But why do you tarry? Bring forth what you will. So the, the, the pagans, the uh, Romans that is, and also the Jews, they're um, cheering that they're going to get to see him burned at the stake. And uh, according to some accounts, the Jews were the, the more energetic in going out and collecting wood to, to bring in. And as they were um, about to fix him to the stake on this uh, pile of wood, and uh, they were going to nail him to the, to the stake, he said, leave me as I am, for he who gives me strength to endure the fire will also enable me, without you securing me by nails, to remain without moving in the pile. And then he prayed, O Lord God Almighty, the Father of your beloved and blessed Son, Jesus Christ, I give you thanks that you have counted me worthy of this day and this hour, that I should have a part in the number of your martyrs, in the cup of your Christ, to the resurrection of eternal life, both of soul and body. I praise you for all things. I bless you. I glorify you along with the everlasting and heavenly Jesus Christ. Amen. So in his um, um, burning at the stake, there was about uh, four miracles that happened. I'm just going to recount one of them. So they're, they're lighting this uh, fire under him. And, um, and as this fire is beginning to to burn, uh, it's burning up, but but this fire mysteriously like goes around him, and doesn't like um, doesn't like burn him. And he's standing in, this, in the middle with this uh, envelope of fire around him, and he's unhurt. And uh, finally, one of the soldiers used a sword to to kill him. That was uh, one of probably at least uh, at least three more, maybe four more uh, miracles that happened. Uh, in his in his death there, so we're going to look at this um, account here that we just read from Revelation two, and um, there's a few things that are unique about this. For one, it's the shortest um, passage, uh, the shortest um, letter to any of the churches. It's also um, the one that doesn't give anything negative about the church. Out of the seven, five of them have um, things critical of the church, but Smyrna uh, has none. Smyrna is also a city that is still surviving to this day. Smyrna is uh, today called Izmar. It's a port city on, I think, the western side of uh, Turkey. And um, the word Smyrna is the synonymous with, it's the same word, as the word myrrh. And um, in fact, Smyrna, Smyrna was a major exporter of myrrh. And myrrh is uh, produced by crushing the roots of a plant that is called uh, like the Smyrna plant. And it's quite likely, uh, because they were a major exporter of myrrh, that most of the references in the Bible of myrrh uh, would have likely come from this place. We have different references in the Bible to myrrh, even at the time of the tabernacle. Uh, however, at the time of the tabernacle, the city did not yet exist. But like at the time of Jesus' birth, uh, the city had already existed for a thousand years, so there was, um, you know, uh, quite likely that uh, some of those uh, things could have come from the city. It was a, a, a large city at the time of this writing. It probably had about 100,000 people in the city, which is about two-thirds the size of uh, Springfield. You know, it's a pretty, pretty big city. And uh, they, they were very proud of their city. The Romans had done a lot of things that had... Um, uh, established their uh, nation, but uh, particularly to the city, uh, like on the coins from Smyrna, uh, it says the first city of Asia. And um, anyway, their, the nickname of the city was the glory of Asia. And then they also had another nickname to the city, uh, which I'll get to in just a second. So th they were uh, very uh, proud of their city's history. So the city had been built about a thousand years before the time of Christ. 
And then it only survived about 400 years to about 600 BC, and then it was uh, destroyed in a war. And then it was uh, laying desolate for roughly 300 years before the city was then um, rebuilt by some uh, generals who had succeeded uh, Alexander the Great. And so because of that, it was uh, considered to be a city that had been resurrected. It was a city that had died and come back to life. And uh, it's interesting that that quote in verse 8, uh, Jesus said, these things says the first and the last who was dead and came back to life. He was almost exactly quoting the, the slogan of Smyrna. So I think uh, Jesus is saying that, you know, like your allegiance is to be to me uh, rather than to, to this world. In this uh, city, they had a huge um, amphitheater, which is where Polycarp had been killed uh, by, by fire. And this amphitheater held like 20,000, had 20,000 seats. So the city of Smyrna, unlike Ephesus, which um, we had looked at last time, uh, we have in the book of Acts a lot of things uh, written about the church at Ephesus. We have nothing written in the New Testament about Smyrna. Uh, with the exception in Acts uh, 19, it may establish where Smyrna came from uh, during Paul's third missionary journey. There it says that the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. That's Acts 19.10. So um, people speculate that that may be the formation coming out of the third missionary journey of where this um, church in Smyrna was started. So um, Caesar worship was very strong in Smyrna. Um, you know, we, we look at the history of the Roman Empire and we think of them as being ruthless and brutal and, and uh, probably those things are, are very true. But um, they actually were quite, the residents there were quite proud of their place. They loved their country. Uh, it, was, uh, it was peaceful, unlike a lot of other countries. And um, they had uh, the best roads in the Roman Empire, they had a communication system, they had a system of laws and courts. The, the pirates from the seas had been um, taken care of, and so they had a you know, pretty, you know, maybe their lives were put together there. So out of that, instead of um, like a top-down uh, control from the Roman Empire, the people there actually loved their nation, and, um, and the people of the nation wanted to worship their emperor. And at first that was uh, resisted, but eventually they you know, kind of accepted that. And after a while they embraced it and required it. So much so that when it comes to this time, uh, emperor worship was uh, compulsory. And then if you didn't um, worship the emperor and say that Caesar is Lord, then you'd be considered a traitor and uh, like a threat to the nation. Well, if, if it's coming from the people that are so much, you know, the, the general populace is so uh, strong in their patriotic support of their nation, then um, those that are not on board with that, such as the Christians, would be very sidelined from society. And so they wouldn't um, be able to get jobs. And so they become destitute. They couldn't um, buy and sell. And it was easy to identify who those people were just because they wouldn't um, they wouldn't embrace the, the slogan that Caesar is Lord. And so because of that, they would face persecution. It could be the, the rack where they would um, literally stretch people to the point of uh, separating limb from body, or uh, they would also, of course, the Colosseum, there would be people that would be dipped or submerged in boiling oil and uh, different types of things. In the case of uh, Polycarp being burned at the stake. So, that's, uh, that's kind of the environment that, um, that this church is found in. And Jesus says that there are three things that he knows about them. If you're facing uh, discouragement and uh, martyrdom, you know, wouldn't it be a, a great comfort to know that the Lord sees and he is aware, he's paying attention, they're not forgotten. So the one thing that Jesus says that he knows about them is, he says, I know your tribulation. That's taken from verse 9. It was um, no doubt like a, a weight, this uh, persecution that was upon them. He says, I know your poverty. So um, like I was saying how uh, the, the Christians would be um, excluded from society 
And they would even be called um, by society, the Christians were considered to be atheists. And the reason was because they didn't worship the Roman gods. And then thirdly, um, the Lord says that I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. And what exactly that all means is a little bit unclear, but evidently there was uh, people, there's different trains of thought, but there was people who evidently were uh, claiming to be Jews, whatever that means. Uh, some people uh, believe that that actually is a reference to, to being Christians, or it may, it, it's hard to say what exactly that means, but in any case, whatever that was, it was, um, it was something that made life very difficult for the, for the Christians, and the Lord says, you know, I, I know that. And um, these, these same types of things were things that Jesus suffered as well. He suffered persecution, he suffered poverty, and um, certainly suffered at the hands of um, some who, who claimed to be his followers, if you think of Judas, who was a, a betrayer. So Jesus um, also responds with uh, two messages for them in verse 10. He says, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. And then also in verse 10, he says, be faithful to death. So it appears like Jesus is saying to the church here that things are going to become worse, um, not better, and that they should just remain steadfast, remain faithful. There's going to be prison and persecution, tribulation ahead. And for some, there would be uh, no escape of suffering in this life. For some, there would be no light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, some, like Polycarp, who came um, years after this was written and would have been familiar with this letter, uh, would not have you know, seen any um, relief in this life. But um, of course, the, the promise instead that he would um, receive comes in verse 11. So one more thing that we've uh, missed before we go there is in verse 9. It says, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And how were they rich? Well, a few things uh, stand out. Spiritually, they were strong. This uh, church received no uh, admonition of any kind. They had the recognition of Jesus. They had a reward, which is in verse 11, that uh, those who overcome shall not be hurt by the second death. And furthermore, he says, I will give you, verse 10, I will give you the crown of life to those who are faithful to death. May the Lord bless.